Thank you everyone for joining us for this OIST Foundation webinar. Uh, we're very excited to have over 100 people joining us. And as we're waiting for uh, everyone to uh, sign on to the webinar, we'd like to ask the audience a few quick polls. And the first poll question is a very simple one. We'd love to know where you are joining us from. Are you joining us from uh, Okinawa? We know we have a number of people who uh, typically do join us since OIST is uh, based in Okinawa. Uh, are you joining us from other parts of Japan, uh, from the United States, uh, or from outside of the United States and Japan? And I'll leave this up for about 10 more uh, seconds, uh, and I'll share the current results. Uh, right now, it looks like we have 29% uh, from Okinawa, 6% from other parts of Japan, uh, over half from the United States, and a few people from outside of uh, both countries uh, so far. So thank you for taking the time to do that. And another uh, poll that we uh, question we'd love for you to answer is simply uh, in regard to climate change. How concerned are you about climate change and its impact on our planet? Uh, four possible responses here, extremely concerned, concerned, somewhat concerned, or not too concerned. Uh, and right now we have 25% uh, extremely concerned. Uh, uh, actually, it's moved up now, 70% extremely concerned, 27% uh, concerned, a few people somewhat concerned, and no one who is not concerned. Uh, so I will share this with everyone so you can take a look yourselves at the results of uh, the audience. And uh, thank you all so very much for taking uh, the time to participate uh, in that. So now that we have a good number of people who have joined us, uh, I'd very much like to welcome everyone, wish everyone a good evening. If you're joining us from uh, the east uh, coast of the United States, uh, a good afternoon if you're in Hawaii, and a good morning if you're in Japan. Thank you so much for joining this OIST Foundation uh, webinar titled Mitigating Climate Impact uh, Via Innovation. I am David Jaynes of the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology and the OIST Foundation. And this is the third webinar in a new three-part webinar series directed by the OIST Foundation uh, that focuses on some of the most important global issues of deep concern to the United States and Japan, climate change, environmental conservation, and its impact. This series is supported by a grant from the Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnership. We're very appreciative of that support. And tonight's webinar is also co-sponsored by Elemental Accelerator. The founder and CEO uh, is one of our panelists and we're, we're very pleased uh, to, that they're co-sponsoring this. And the OIS Foundation, for those who don't know, is a US-based nonprofit organization that supports scientific breakthroughs, innovation, and the sustainable development of Okinawa through OIST. And OIST is the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University, an interdisciplinary graduate school offering a five-year PhD program in the sciences based in Okinawa. The main task of OIST is to produce groundbreaking research for the benefit of humankind. Tonight's webinar is on the record, it is being recorded, and we want to make sure the audience is aware that we want your engagement. So uh, the flow tonight will be uh, several presentations and then a moderated discussion, uh, but at any time we welcome you to ask questions through chat or through the Q&A feature. We'll collect those and we will uh, do our best to get some answers to your questions, so please do engage us. Tonight's moderator, I am so pleased uh, to have her here, is Dr. Jennifer Costley. She is Director of Physical Sciences, Sustainability, and Engineering at the New York Academy of Sciences. I'm going to turn the floor over to her in just a second. I just want to let everyone know that we have circulated uh, earlier today the bios for all of the speakers. Uh, and later during the program, at some point, I will try to put some of those bios in chat as well. But in order to save time, we'll uh, limit our introductions. Uh, and so with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Costley. And again, thank you so much for serving as our moderator tonight. Excellent, David. Thank you. And first, I'd like to thank you, David, and the OIST Foundation for organizing this webinar and to all of you who are attending. You know, according to the World Meteorological Organization, their recently released report on the state of global climate, 2020 is on track 
to be one of the three warmest years on record globally. Carbon dioxide levels are at record highs and the upward trend has continued despite the pandemic. In a speech earlier this month at Columbia University, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres cited three imperatives in addressing the climate crisis. First, achieving carbon neutrality within the next three decades. Second, aligning global finance behind the Paris Agreement. And third, delivering a breakthrough on adaptation to protect the world and especially the most vulnerable people and countries from climate impacts. This is a moment of truth for people and planet alike, he said, where the global community must take a collective step forward toward a safer, more sustainable and equitable path. The international community has a chance to not simply reset the world economy, but to transform it to a sustainable one driven by renewable energy that will create new jobs, cleaner infrastructure and a resilient future. Our panelists today have very different backgrounds and field of expertise, but what unites all of them is their commitment to breakthroughs in science and technology to address these challenges. As I introduce our panel, I'm going to ask each of them to talk briefly about their work in this moment of truth. Our first panelist is Naoko Yamazaki. She's a retired astronaut and space policy expert and a council member at the Earthshot Prize. You'll find her full bio in the chat window uh, when David gets it posted there and also it was circulated to you. So I'll turn it over to you at this point, Naoko. And thanks Jennifer for the kind introduction and good morning, hello, good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for the David and the uh, Oyster Foundation to invite me to this webinar. It's my great pleasure to join it. So uh, I was on board the International Space Station and the Space Shuttle in 2010. And uh, let me, Move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so of course, the International Space Station ISS was uh, started its assembly in 1998 and started its human residence in 20 2000. So we just celebrated the 20th anniversary of the continuous human residence on board the ISS. And the sustainability is the key point to maintain the ISS just like on the Earth. For example, the water is recycling, but currently only 60%, a little bit of more than 60% water is uh, be able to be recycled. So we need to improve this a little bit more. And the air is also recycled. We absorb carbon dioxide and turn it into oxygen. But the clothes, we cannot wash them on board. So we have to throw them away after a couple of years. So we need improvement. And electrical power is sus sustainable. We use solar power and, of course, battery. And the food relies on the supply from the ground, so we need to improve it. But the next, so now uh, we are working towards the space basis. Uh, next slide, please. And also we have 3D printers so that we can uh, create a couple of tools and some necessary items on board. So it should reduce the supply from the ground. So next please. And what astonished me most was the thinness of the atmosphere. If we look up the sky, the sky seems to continue forever, but it's not, it's very thin. So this thin of layer of atmosphere uh, protects us. So that's surprising in next place. And next, please, another shot of the atmosphere. And next, please. And this is, of course, a picture of the sun. It's so bright and it has a lot of energy source. But sometimes, you know, we have to consider not only the Earth, but we have to consider the sun as well because we are in an ecosystem. And next, please. And during the day, time, you know, I was very surprised to see the strong strengths of the nature. But next, please. At night, I was also impressed with the power of human beings watching the city lights. And next, please. And of course, the Earth is said to be a blue watery planet. But next, please, if we collect all the water in one place, there is such a small amount of water, just like this small blue dot. And 97% of this water is salty water. And only 3% is a pure water for the daily life use. So next, please. 
And actually in the solar system, Ganymede or Titan has more H2O comparing to the Earth. So right now uh, we are exploring the solar systems to find more uh, resources so that we can utilize them as well. So next please. And uh, after uh, my mission, uh, I support a couple of environmental actions like a uh, uh, couple together with a couple of astronauts, we submitted uh, the video message to the COP21 and I also sent a message to the TED talk. And two months ago, uh, I was assigned to a council of this Earthshot Prize, which was created by uh, Prince William of UK and uh, Global Environmental Prize. Of course, the naming is from a moonshot of Apollo program. So which means turn impossible into possible. And the web page is in eight languages, so please take it, uh, take a look at it later. And next, please. So the Arsha Prize covers five areas: nature, air, oceans, waste fleet, and climate. Everything is connected to each other, of course. And the prize uh, is for the individuals, teams, or even countries. And not only technologies, but policies, systems, and new idea, but it should be evidence-based. And uh, we have more than 100 nominating partners globally. So I'm looking forward to working with you all. And next, please. And here is the council members. So uh, I'm uh, right now uh, very much, uh, you know, sincere or I'd like to work sincerely for to uh, take action for the climate change but it's not only uh, one person cannot do this and one team cannot do this so I hope you know we can put our uh, power together to make a better world thank you very much thank you Naoko you know it's interesting they say a picture can be worth a thousand words and I think that those pictures of the earth and the thinness of the atmosphere and and the statements that you made about how little water we have are really very revealing and enlightening. So much appreciate your, your talk. Our next panelist is going to be Professor Noriyuku Sato of the Marine Genomics Unit at OIST. So welcome, Professor Sato. Yeah, thank you very much for invitations. So uh, uh, in Japan at the morning, uh, this morning, I would like to in introduce uh, some coral reef preservation project uh, ongoing at Okinawa. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, so, as you know, coral reefs occupy just only 0.2% of the sea, but they host nearly 25% uh, of marine organisms. That means the uh, coral reefs are one of the most biodiversity kind of hotspots on the earth. And Okinawa, uh, approximately uh, 400 coral species exist in the Okinawa archipelagos. And this is very important for tourism, fisheries, and others. Next slide, please. So uh, uh, recently uh, by climate change, uh, coral reef are suffered so much. And the two big issue is the uh, crown zone starfish and the bleaching of a coral. So uh, this morning, I just introduced you our uh, bleaching of corals in Okinawa areas. So uh, in worldwide in 1998, it's El Nino. And so uh, in, in Okinawa, seawater temperature raised at the 32, uh, degrees Celsius. And usually uh, 30, okay, but 32, and this keep around the uh, two or three weeks, it's damaged so much on the coral uh, bleaching. And the uh, next uh, big co coral bleaching occurred at uh, 2016. Next slide, please. So our, this is the uh, <clears throat> ground of zone starfish, Be very big are uh, starfish. They uh, eat corals, so and they damage the so much. And uh, uh, Great Valley Reef in Australia, 
um, uh, approximately 30% uh, uh, of a cause of uh, uh, cola leaf damage uh, caused by the uh, this kind of crown or starfish. Next, next slide, please. So uh, in 1998, uh, Okinawa uh, seawater temperature raised so much, so very big coral bleaching in Okinawa. So you can see the uh, light panels, uh, lead areas. It's a it's a little bit shallow kind of a seawater areas. Uh, most of the kind of uh, uh, shallow water areas, uh, coral leaf uh, died and just cover less than 45% uh, of a coral. Next slide, please. So uh, Okinawa Prefecture started some kind of a project to restoration of a coral leaf by transplantation of corals. In this case, uh, mainly uh, uh, asexual kind of transplantation. So first, uh, broken, break the uh, coral branch and then fix to some kind of a substrate and uh, develop to small colony. So usually not for five to uh, eight months. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and then our uh, last decade in the Okinawa areas, uh, uh, this project uh, succeeded into the uh, uh, one, uh, 150,000 branch at three hectare areas. Next slide, please. However, one question is, one question, the one problem is here is, corals are hermaphrodite. And so they spawn eggs and sperm simultaneously. However, cell fertilization doesn't occur. This means that if you uh, planted the uh, corals from the uh, same uh, kind of origin, after spawning, the sperm and the eggs did not fertilize. Next slide, please. So uh, my uh, research groups uh, develop a method to identify the colonies, each colonies. And so next slide, please. So we like to now uh, identify the every kind of a colony. So the le uh, left side is the colony A and right side the colony B. So uh, we uh, suggest the kind of a fisherman for transplantation to mix at least four or five different colonies together to get the uh, uh, nice kind of genetic diversity. Next slide, please. So about the uh, uh, five years ago, uh, transplanted colony begin to spawn. Like you can see, the uh, tiny kind of dot is a, a spawn, a spawning of a corals, and this includes both spermers and eggs. And okay, so next slide, please. So uh, uh, we uh, Okinawa uh, Prefecture transplanted the uh, corals and then make some kind of artificial corals. It's uh, about fifth. Uh, five meters dips. And then the uh, 20 meters or so dips, there are kind of a natural kind of a coral leaves. So right now it is mixing the uh, artificial corals and natural corals, making a, a hybrid corals. So uh, we hope to follow uh, this kind of uh, uh, activi activity to, to make a kind of a artificial, artificial coral leaves help somehow to uh, restoration of the coral leaf in near future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sato. It's really nice to see a message of hope for corals coming from your research. That was, that was really uh, inspiring. Our third panelist is going to be Don Lippert, who's the CEO of Elementor Accelerator. That's El Accelerator with an EX. Um, and you'll be able to see her full bio in the chat window or in the um, email that was sent to you. I'd like to thank her for participating and turn this over to Dawn. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And thank you to OIST for the opportunity to participate in today's panel and all the work that you're doing on climate. So important. Um, I actually wanted to start off by sharing uh, just like the connection between Okinawa and Hawaii. 
Um, I'm calling in today from Honolulu, Hawaii. And on the next slide, you'll see, um, you know, just what Jennifer sort of talked about is what we're what we're trying to address in terms of climate. Um, I think one of the really important things that sort of grabs me every morning when I'm thinking about the climate challenge is just the impact of time on the climate challenge. So what you see here on the chart on the left um, is basically a visual representation of what Jennifer shared in her opening, which is the paths that we actually have to follow as a society to um, keep our cumulative warming below two degrees Celsius. And you can see that this drop in emissions that's required because we're starting so late in 2020 or 2021 in terms of actually dropping emissions, we have a very steep path that we have to meet to keep warming below two degrees Celsius. So this chart really uh, keeps me up at night because if we wait until next year to peak emissions, the drop has to be even steeper and the following year even steeper. So time has such an important element here. And then on the right, you'll see the where the greenhouse gas emissions actually come from and where we've sort of aligned our investments at Elemental Accelerator and our work around climate. Uh, we have some really good bright spots. On the next slide, you'll see, and this is actually um, a Hawaii-Okinawa Memorandum of Cooperation for Clean and Efficient Energy Development and Deployment. Um, governor David Ige of Hawaii is our uh, first Okinawa, first governor of Okinawan ancestry. Um, and this is Okinawa governor Takeshi Onaga. And so this is, I think, emblematic of what states and localities are doing to um, share what's happening across energy and across climate action, across geographies. So it's really inspiring and such a pleasure to be um, with many of our friends from Okinawa and Japan here today. Uh, so this is how we are tackling the issues at Elemental Accelerator. We're a nonprofit organization based in Honolulu, Hawaii, and in Silicon Valley, California. Um, we know that climate change is here and that we need to act urgently to solve it. And what we do at Elemental is help entrepreneurs. So we understand that entrepreneurs are already scaling up solutions to climate change. You can think about Tesla, about um, big solar companies, about so many of the entrepreneurs that we already see. Um, and we, our job at Elemental is to help them do it faster and do it together in, in combination with communities. So we work at the intersection of climate action and social equity. Um, that's the work we do at, at Elemental Accelerator and we fund companies um, who are working both on climate action and social equity. So you can move to the next slide now. Um, I just wanna give you a little example. This one is, is really recent, just from actually about a week ago. This is on Maui. Many of you may have visited Maui. Um, this is a picture of the hybrid electric aircraft that we've co-funded. You can see our logo on it here, along with Ampere, the startup company has developed this hybrid electric aircraft. This aircraft has gone farther than any other hybrid electric aircraft ever. And on Maui, our project with Ampere is to demonstrate the first hybrid electric airplane on a commercial route. So taking cargo back and forth from Kahului on Maui to Hana, Maui. And it's really exciting. It can save 50% of the jet fuel. Think of it like a Prius flying through the air, a Toyota Prius. So this is just one of the companies that we're working with. Um, and to date, we've looked at over 5,000 technologies and awarded over $40 million in funding to over 100 companies. So this is one of the companies that's proving it's possible. Here are just a, three more examples to give you a sense of, of what this looks like across Hawaii, California, and really all across the Asia Pacific. These are projects that we're funding with companies um, to infuse carbon into concrete in Hawaii. Um, in the middle, you can see um, exactly what Naoko is talking about around clothing. How do we create sort of circular systems for clothing and reduce waste? One of our portfolio companies, Tro, is doing just that. They take old clothes that you had from Patagonia or other brands and they fix them up, clean them up and resell them to you through those brands' websites. And the third company that we work with is called Zero Mass um, Source International. And they take water out of the air using just sun. These are actually water panels behind these folks here that it's just creating fresh drinking water straight from the sun. And we're deploying that one across Australia. So working with entrepreneurs, we can see that this climate future, much more sustainable future 
is possible. You can go to the next slide. Um, the way that Elemental is structured is that we have three key funders, government, corporate, and philanthropy. I think one of the things we've learned over the years, we've been doing this work for 10 years in partnership with many community partners, our partners in Hawaii at PICTOR, the Pacific International Center for High Technology Research, um, partners across many geographies in Europe, across the US mainland and, and other places. Um, and what we've seen is that government, corporates, and philanthropy can actually work together. They have similar goals around climate. And our role is to be a platform to try and bring all of those funders together, bring all of those ideas together, and then use them to help startups make a real impact. You can go to the next slide. Um, these are just some of the corporate partners that we work with from that one piece of it. And I just wanted to highlight the four in green, which are four of our corporate partners that hail from Japan. We see Japan as a really extraordinary leader on climate technology and climate action. And it's been really exciting to partner with some leading Japanese corporations who are on their own pathway to decarbonization and seeing how startups can actually work with those corporates to help make that happen faster. Many of the corporates that you see on this, on this slide that are partners of Elemental, they know that decarbonization requires partners, new technology, they can't just do it alone. And so they're leaning in to, to help. Um, so you can go to one more here. I, I just wanna finish off here with just an invitation. Uh, we just launched our podcast called Scaling to Zero just about a week and a half ago. Um, and the reason we did this was, you know, I think one of the things that's been exciting about Elemental and working with entrepreneurs is, you know, just like on the coral reefs, finding those sort of moments of hope and those places of inspiration is so valuable. And when we, when we talk to entrepreneurs that are building the next hydrogen airplane or bringing electric vehicles to underserved communities or bringing fresh water to uh, places that need it, it's so inspiring and it's so hopeful and it gives us ideas for um, how to grow and scale other um, means of impact. And so we wanted to open up these personal conversations that we have with entrepreneurs to people all over the world so that they can have access to that inspiration as well. So our, our Scaling to Zero podcast is these really in-depth conversations um, with entrepreneurs. So um, that's, where, that's where we are to date. Um, it's been an incredible year for climate action in 2020, even just the last month or couple of months have seen a huge amount of investment and action in, in climate. Um, we're very excited to, to see the US lean into being a leader again in the future. Um, and we really see that this is the time to lean into both climate action and social justice together and to understand how interconnected those those two are and they have to be addressed together. So thanks very much. Great, thank you, Donna. It was really great to hear your stories about what can be done and what's happening on the ground and out in the field. So very much appreciate um, that. And I'll have a couple of questions for you later. Um, our final panelist is Afshan Jamshed. She's a PhD candidate in the Energy Materials and Surface Sciences Unit at OIST. And we're looking forward to hearing about your research, Afshan. So over to you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm sorry. I, OK, now here we go. OK, good morning and good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, Jennifer and David and the OIST Foundation to giving me an opportunity to present our work, what we are doing uh, at OIST for using the solar energy. So uh, I'll be discussing about the atomic scale approach to the perovskite solar cells and how we are doing it we will go here. So first we know we have the present energies and the future energies too, right? So everybody knows here like the carbon dioxide emission and the global warming. And this is like the what energy we are getting at the moment that's provided by the oil, it's 35%, right? But oil would not run over world forever, that's we know. There will be a one time in the future when we will be having a last drop of oil. So when we reach to that condition, our time, how we are going to solve our problem for the energies? So there are the question, 
what will be it be and how we are dealing this the increasing energy demands for the future too when we will be running out of it so as we know everybody we have a huge uh, the free uh, renewable sources from the nature available in which we have like a solar energy biomass energy wind energy ocean energy and geothermal energy and hydropower energy these are all freely available energy which we can use for our benefit what i'm doing here at oist that is about the solar energy and i'll be talking about this energy so we know that we have a solar energy available every day so one sun is providing us 23000 terawatt of energy uh, for the thing and the global energy consumption is just 16 terawatt so if we have a sunlight for one hour we can get energy for the whole society for the whole year and that's you can see how the sun is helping us now how we can take this solar energy and convert it to the electricity or to the solar resources which we needed to do it so for that purpose we have the solar cell solar cell is basically converting the solar energy for, to the electrical energy and from when this study started about the solar energy so we have like a three different generation of solar cells the first generation solar cell then second generation solar cells and the third generation solar cell first generation solar cell com commercialization was start later in 1970 before that the solar cell was used for the satellite application but after that later in 1970s they started producing it for the uh, home appliances and for the daily use of the people too. So we are not going to talk about the first generation and second generation solar cells. My main focus will be about the third generation of solar cells, which is the perovskite solar cells. And how we are approaching to this perovskite solar cells. So we are approaching this in the two ways, right? But before going to that, I will introduce what is perovskite solar cells and how it begin in the research community to solve the solar energy uh, problems. So in 2009, Kojima et al. from Japan, they used for the first time this perovskite material for the solar cell. And that was the first time when they used it. And the power conversion efficiency of this solar cell was just 3.8%. Why we are using this perovskite solar cell? It has a more advantages than other generation of solar cells, namely like a high efficiency. So it started in 2009 with 3.8%, but now in 2020, the power conversion efficiency reached 25.6%. So you can see within a one decade, it raised from 38 to 25.6%, which is showing it has a tendency to improve it more for our use and for our application. The fabrication process and the, the cost is very low in comparison with other generation of solar cells and upscaling is possible too. Now with these all advantages, it has some disadvantages too, which we need to focus on and try to improve it. So these solar cells are very good in power conversion efficiency, fabrication cost is low, everything is good, but there is a one problem and that is the instability. So when these solar cells, like a perovskite solar cell exposed to the air, they start degrading. Their lifetime is not as long as the other generation solar cells. And these, what are the ex external parameter which is causing these instability? That is the oxygen, UV light, moisture, temperature, and corrosive molecules. And these are the old parameter where the solar cell has to meet them when they are, once they come out from the lab or from the industry. So our motivation here at OIST is we are creating a platform to understand these perovskite material at the atomic scale and try to improve the stability for the future perovskite solar cell for the mass production. Here at OIST, in the Energy Material and Surface Science Unit, we are approaching this uh, problem in two different ways. In first way, we are reaching this at device level. We are using different techniques to improve the stability of these solar cells and to increase the power conver conversion efficiency. And the other sub team, which I belong to, I'm working in it, we are approaching to the materials at atomic scale. So we go at atomic scale by the scanning tunneling microscopy and get their atomic resolution images and understand their lattice parameters. And then we see all the interaction of these external parameters at atomic le level. And then we try to improve them by doping another or mixing another material with it and to make it more reliable and stable for the future solar cells. So these are the two approaches 
where we are uh, trying to solve this, this uh, solar cell problem. Thank you very much here. And my talk is end here, yeah. Great, thank you. It must be very exciting to be doing research that has the promise to really help us achieve a more sustainable world. So good for you. Yeah. What I'd like to do now, we're gonna start the moderated discussion. So I'd like all of the panelists to come um, up on the video, please. And um, like to start actually with a question for Nyoko. Um, Nyoko, you're trained as an engineer. Could you tell us a little bit about what kind of innovations were needed to be successful in the space program and how does that compare to what's going to be needed to successfully address the challenges of climate change? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, when we design a spacecraft, we have to balance everything. For example, uh, electrical power or air, atmosphere, or heat and water, everything should be balanced. And actually, the heat balance was very critical because in spaceships, there is no air convection, so we have to use active heat pipe to collect heat from all the electrical equipments and to radiate uh, those heat to the outside of spacecraft. So it's the same. We have to consider the Earth as one spacecraft and should be balanced for the every resources and heat, you know, including heat generation and so on. So I think that's a key point. Great, thank you. Afshan, I have a question for you. Um, what are the limitations for commercialization of those uh, perovskite solar cells? And how are you trying to solve the issues to make them uh, more, the technology that they're based on more climate friendly? Oh, yeah. So as I said, they have advantages, but the disadvantages like this instability, which is we are trying to make it more stable. So power conversion efficiency is improving every year by year. We can see it from the chart, but the stability is still not in under control, which we are trying to do it. And how to make it a climate friendly. So at the moment in perovskite solar cell, we are using lead, which is toxic, and we cannot really take it out to the environment. So that's why we are trying to replace this lead in it to improve, like we are still checking it and uh, measuring it, like how we can improve the power conversion efficiency and stability without lead. So at the moment, that is a challenging point for us, but we are optimistic and hopeful maybe next four or five years, we will be able to commercialize these perovskite solar cells too. Great. Could you talk a little bit about the instability, uh, a little bit more about the instability and what is that, um, what does that imply? Is it the degradation that means it has to be replaced more frequently or are there other implications of it? So degradation is happening, but the problem is like if they are instable and degradation happening, so what will be happening, this lead will be introducing to the environment. It can mix to the water, it can mix to the earth and thing which is not safe at all, right? So for that purpose, we are really trying to provide like some high quality encapsulation and also when they are degraded, we have to replace them, right? So we need to find a way how to dispose them because it contains leads. So for that purpose, we want to design some solar cells, which at least can work for 10 to 20 years. At least in that way, we can at least control like the production of it and reduce the uh, toxicity of lead in it to the environment too. Okay, great. Thank you. Don, I actually have a, qu a couple of questions for you. The first one is you mentioned social equity and climate action and how they converge. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Examples of that convergence? I'm not sure that everyone in the audience really understands why those things come together. Sure, I mean, we see them in so many different ways. I mean, I think some of the examples are around air pollution and water pollution. Um, in specific communities, what, we, what are called frontline communities, for instance, um, that are traditionally under-resourced. So you folks may have caught in the last couple of days, there was an article um, about a nine-year-old girl who died. And it was one of the first cases ever where one of the causes of death was identified as air pollution. Yeah, I did uh, see that, yeah. And I think that you know, air pollution contributes to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people around the world. Um, and is actually one of the top three causes of death identified by the World Health Organization, but has been really hard to sort of pinpoint in that way. Um, many of the, um, the statistics that we have and sort of the information we have is that air pollution um, really disproportionately affects people who have less access to resources. So that's one, you know, and climate changes um, and the 
emitting sources, whether it's power plants or vehicles or other sources of mobility are very tightly correlated with um, particulate air pollution and other kinds of air pollution. But I think more broadly, as we think about climate and um, the impacts of climate in the Pacific on islands and sea level rise um, and fires, storms, it's, it's people that have less access to resources that are gonna be more impacted by these climate disasters over time. And so the income inequality that we see and sort of social justice issues we see are completely tied to our ability to impact climate change. Um, let me just give one example of how, you know, so that's kind of the macro challenge that we're trying to address. And I'll just give one, one example of how we're doing that sort of on the ground with entrepreneurs. Because I think part of what we're trying to do is embed social justice and social equity and awareness into companies early so that as they grow and become the biggest companies that create the industrial future that we live in, we actually are building in social equity from the beginning, as opposed to sort of adding it on at the end, you know, with sort of afterthoughts. So it's about really building into the DNA of a company. Um, one example on that front is a company that we've worked with called Remix, which is a company that does transportation planning software. And they essentially take, um, have software that means that instead of using paper and pencils to identify where roads should be and where a highway is gonna go, where bike lanes should go. They have a software so that city planners can collaborate um, online in real time to develop different scenarios for transportation. And transportation networks are huge determinants of how neighborhoods look and um, what kinds of opportunities people have. So what we've done with, with them is, is with Remix, a lot of cities have been asking Remix, well, we're curious if you put a highway here versus a road over there, what's the impact on social equity? What's the impact on justice and some of the demographics that we care about? And there traditionally hasn't been a way to measure that. So at Elemental, we funded a project with Remix and with community-based organizations to say, let's develop a tool to actually measure that. And it's not just the startup, it needs to be a much more broad-based design process. And we actually designed a whole uh, year-long process with design sprints and community feedback sessions to implement metrics so that you're saying, okay, well, if we're gonna build roads over here or build bike lanes over there, this is what that's gonna look like in terms of equity. And you can give these different plans an actual score in terms of social equity. So if you can kind of build this into companies early and build those tools and capabilities into companies that are defining how we move around, how we live, what we eat, what we drink over time, then we can build a much more equitable system over time. So that's a, that's a big example. Great, thank you. My second question for you was really around decarbonization and given the work that you've done in terms of entrepreneurs and, and new innovations, what are some of the scientific and technical breakthroughs that you think are going to be needed for decarbonization? Um, and what kind of impact can you think, do you think they can have? Yeah, well, I mean, often people think about decarbonization, they sort of immediately jump to clean energy um, and electrifying you know, transportation, which are two of the biggest sources of emissions. Um, but since they're more well understood, I think I'd like to highlight two others that people sure. have a little bit less time talking about. One is actually what I re referred to earlier, which is around clothing. So the apparel industry for, for clothing is responsible for 10% of global emissions. And there's a huge amount of waste in our apparel industry. Many of the clothes that are manufactured never even see stores and they're just burned. Um, and there's a huge amount of waste all across the supply chain. So some of the companies that we're interested in are attacking this from a technical angle of actually being able to recycle the fibers in different clothing. And other companies are tackling it from a reuse angle. Of how do you actually bring clothes out of people's closets, get them into circulation? Um, the data show that the reuse market will be bigger than the new clothing market within about five to 10 years. So this is a huge business opportunity as well as an opportunity for climate. Um, and those are the kinds of places where we see a real opportunity to invest from a climate perspective where the markets are changing very quickly um, and there's a huge climate impact to be had. The second one in that same vein that, that people are, are not thinking about enough, I think for climate is around our food systems and food waste. So we're thinking about this across the entire value chain of food from how we store uh, carbon in soils and 
implement regenerative agriculture practices all the way to food waste and, and how do we reuse food waste. One of our portfolio companies, the company called Gooder, and they collect food waste from restaurants and grocery stores and all kinds of different sources and distribute it to people who need it. Um, and they've found a way to do that that is legal and lawful and really works at scale in a technology enabled way. So I think as we're looking at sort of agriculture and um, sort of fashion and apparel, those are two of the underinvested areas that we're really interested in from a climate solutions and decarbonization perspective. Great, thank you. Now, I guess the astronauts aren't the only ones who have trouble with uh, clothes and food in terms of its recyclability. Um, yeah, that's important. Good, thanks. My next question is one that anyone can answer if they wish. Um, this question is how can the US and Japan work together in deeper ways to collaborate on climate change related issues? So anyone like to take that question on? Are you shaking your head yes, Naoko? Would you like to go ahead and say something about that? Uh, no, I think there are you know, a couple of layers. Academia, of course, we can do joint research. And I think the evidence base is very important. So the joint based research is very uh, critical. And also the uh, environment uh, industry level or NGO, NPO level or international governmental level. So I think several layers work together is important. Great, thanks. Anyone else like to respond to the question? I think one thing is that the, uh, yeah, so our uh, coral leaf kind of restoration is a big problem in the worldwide, not in, in uh, Okinawa's. So especially, uh, I hope that some kind of a connection between University of Hawaii or Stanford, uh, they are working the some kind of a, the same kind of a project. So this is the uh, imp important for not only OIST, but to collaborate with other university in, in the United States. Great, thank you. Anyone else like to respond to this one? If not, I actually have a couple of questions for Professor Sato. So the first question is, uh, if you could um, tell us why coral reefs are so important and why their survival is dependent on both climate and CO2 levels. Yeah, so uh, uh, as I uh, introduce you uh, th this morning, so the coral reef is the uh, one of the uh, uh, biodiversity ecosystem. It's very important in, in, the, sea, in the sea or on the earth. And also the uh, 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 perhaps the uh, phenomena of uh, climate change is very visible in a coral reef. It's easy because they died, did a breaching and died. So, so uh, uh, compared to the other kind of phenomena uh, caused by the uh, warming, a uh, coral reef is very, what you say, easy to, to see what happens. So, uh, and also, uh, as you know, coral reef is a very, very beautiful place. So they are very much anxious about the kind of bleaching and dying, the uh, diminishing of the coral reef. Coral, uh, leaf. So this is the one reason. And the, uh, the second, our, uh, question is the uh, a coral has some kind of a uh, coral is a, a kind of a unique uh, system in which uh, corals uh, have a kind of uh, obligatory uh, symbiosis with the photosynthetic dinoflagellator. So this kind of uh, a symbiosis it's very naive and so if if the uh, uh, warming raising the seawater temperature and also some acidification, they, this kind of a stress uh, very much affect the kind of a symbiotic relationship. And then the, uh, after uh, getting a stress, uh, uh, dinoflagellator leave from the coral. So coral cannot do uh, survive anymore. So, so this is the, uh, perhaps the reason why the coral leaves so much kind of a naive or nervous to the uh, uh, climate change. Great, thanks. My second question, you actually touched on a little bit when you talked about the cooperation uh, yeah. question between the US and Japan, but um, how successful do you think efforts to rebuild damaged coral reefs can be globally? Is this something yeah. that you think we can, we can actually see great successes with eventually? 
Yeah, so, uh, so I, after joining the uh, OIST, I know that the uh, uh, Okinawa has started some kind of uh, coral reef restorations. And the scale is uh, very big compared to the uh, other side of, of even uh, Great Barrier Reefs. And also, uh, uh, we collaborated with the kind of fishermen or government to restrict the coral leaves, uh, given some kind of uh, uh, genetic background, some information. So this is some collaboration of uh, uh, real kind of uh, uh, preservation person and the uh, scientist together with the get much more kind of a, a effect effective way for coral restoration. And so I really would like to expand this system the worldwide. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, David, how are we doing on questions coming in from the audience? Yeah, thank you so much. We uh, we have about five or six questions from the audience. Uh, so if it sounds good to you, Jennifer. Yeah, I think we should turn. I have a, a couple more questions I could ask, but let's turn it over to the audience. Uh, yeah, well, audience. you know, let's start with a fun one, if we could, from a fourth grader, actually, who has a question for Yamazaki uh, uh, Naoko-san and uh, if I may, th this question uh, is, do the planets really make noises when you're in space? So we had to ask this uh, from a fourth grader who just emailed it in. Oh, wonderful question. Thank you for your question. Well, actually, we cannot hear the actual noise from the Earth, but of course, there are several uh, radio uh, waves emitted from the Earth. So it goes, you know, out, <laughs> outer space as well. So if, you know, some uh, aliens go past through the Earth, probably they can hear the, our radio waves. Actually, there are several such a project to send radio waves intentionally from Earth to outer space so that somebody could hear it someday. Thank you for answering that. The, the next question is directed toward Afshan uh, and your work on solar panels. And it's a question of, uh, are you also, or is your unit also doing any kind of research or work on recycling or reusing solar panels? Uh, not exactly recycling at the moment, but maybe in the future, Professor Chi wants to do something. But at the moment, we are just trying to make it stable and increase the power conversion efficiency and produce a big module of the solar cells for the industrial use. Thank you. There, there's a few questions um, for you, uh, Professor Sato. One of them is, what initiates the crown of thorn starfish outbreak? Wow, so it's a very big problem, but the uh, uh, speaking truly, nobody knows the kind of exact cause of crown zone stuff outbreaks, but it started uh, uh, around the uh, 1950. That means the uh, prior to the uh, bleaching. So first the kind of uh, a coral, coral bleaching stress is the crown zone starfish. And the, uh, uh, they spawn many, many, many small eggs. And the, uh, the, uh, perhaps it's some kind of uh, uh, sea water conditions. They larvae survive a little bit longer than usual. And so they extend from some place to the another place and then settle there and grown up to the uh, uh, crown, uh, adults and eat so many kind of corals. So uh, uh, yeah, it's a very big problem, but the uh, reason or kind of a uh, phenomena not well kind of uh, uh, understand yet. Interesting. And someone else asks uh, Professor Sato, if you need any volunteers for your projects, I guess this is someone who wants to come down or <laughs> help in Okinawa. Do you need uh, volunteers at all for any of your coral related projects? Professor Sato. Yeah, so uh, at, at the moment uh, uh, we are uh, in Okinawa, uh, we are very nice kind of a communication between the fishermen and the prefectures, go governors and the kind of researchers of OIST. So uh, uh, we always discussing some ways to improve that uh, techniques 
and for kind of preservation of coral reefs. So uh, I really wish you some kind of more ideas to a uh, good way to preserve the coral reefs in future. Yeah. Uh, maybe just two quick questions. I'll turn it back to you, Jennifer, for, for final um, uh, question or remarks. But uh, Dawn, uh, just one quick question uh, for you in your chart. Uh, where government is one of the, I think it was on the top of the triangle. Uh, the, the question is about local governments. Um, it, to what extent does uh, Elemental Accelerator uh, work not only with uh, national governments, but also local governments to accomplish change and how important is that? Yeah, thanks for that question. It's such, a, it's such an important question. I actually think that given the markets that we work in, so water, energy, mobility, food and agriculture, these are all very much place-based systems. So they're not just sort of existing, you know, in the internet or virtually. And so local government and local change becomes the most important sort of vector for ensuring that we can make really sustained progress. Um, so local government and state government often hold the regulations and the policy framework under which these companies operate. So I'll just give one brief example, which is um, a company that we've worked with called Carbon Cure. I showed a picture earlier of people pouring concrete, and that was actually on the west side of Oahu near Honolulu. And that concrete has carbon dioxide that's um, been pumped into it so that it sequesters the carbon dioxide forever in the concrete. And this is important because concrete is actually the um, most abundant man-made material in the entire world. So if you can sequester carbon in concrete, it will make a huge difference in climate change. Um, and what's been important is that the state and local governments are actually some, along with the federal government, but also state and local, are some of the largest purchasers of concrete um, in the entire world. So when we did that project, we then worked with the city and the city council to pass a resolution to say, we actually prefer this kind of concrete when we're buying new things, new buildings, new roads. And that sends a signal to the market to try something new, to try something a little innovative um, and to really sequester carbon. So state and local government has a huge role to play, whether it's in policy and the regulatory framework or in being a purchaser and saying, we're gonna go first because we know this is important. Great. Thank you so much. Um, there's a few other questions, but I think I'll turn it over to you, Jennifer, for um, your any last questions you might have. Or sure. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thanks. Thanks for handling that Q and A session. What I'd like to do before we close, I'd like to e ask each of our panelists in turn to sum up in one sentence, and that's going to be harder for some of you than others. But one sentence: what you'd like our audience to do next? What should they learn more about? What action should they take? Or what else should they do? to help mitigate climate change via innovation. So I'll take it on the order of the screen. Afshan, your first one sentence on what our, what our audience should do next. That's quite a difficult task, but I'll try to, <laughs> to solve it. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Um, I think for the climate, I will not go for the solar cell, but I will go definitely for this, the recycling purpose. And we need more ideas from the people because sometimes you get a very great idea from the people who are using like solar panel or something, if they can provide something to us. So we will welcome that and we will try to work on that ideas too. So that's why I will request everybody if they are using solar panels or solar cells. So just keep in mind if they think we can improve it for recycling or they have any other idea. So they just let us know and we will try to work on that. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Um, next, Nioko, you're up. Sure, I'll try. <laughs> I think everyone has a vital role for this uh, climate change action because, you know, the ecosystem of academia, industry, society, and the government is important and connecting all the bridges are very vital. So just remember everyone has a vital role and have a vision and have flexible idea. And I, actually, I got some question from uh, in, about interplanetary travel. I think it's not, uh, that's not mean abandoning the earth. Actually, if we can put uh, power plants or factories emitting contaminants in space, then it could save our home planet, the earth. So just having, you know, flexible ideas. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Great answer. 
Dawn, you're up. Sure. Well, I will say uh, creating opportunities for young people to get involved in climate solutions. We open an in, actually, this is perfect timing because today we just opened our 2021 internship program. I'll, I'll post a link here, but there's 20 internships in our startups um, across all kinds of things, marketing and engineering and different things. Um, last year, we saw 300 people apply to this. We only have you know 20 or 25 spots each year. But I think what it shows is that there is an incredible amount of interest um, from young people in being part of the solution. And I think part of our jobs is to help find pathways for people into climate careers so they can do something that they really care about and will make a huge difference. Great, great. Thank you so much. Professor Sato, you, you go yeah. last. One sentence. <laughs> okay, one sentence. So uh, uh, when I uh, looking or observe the cola leaf, I just say one sentence. Uh, we should do our best effort to keep the nature as it is. That's all. Perfect. Thank you. So David, back to you with some great summaries by our panelists there. So back over to you. Well, I just simply want to thank everyone so much. This has been um, much too short, but uh, it's so incredibly insightful. And I just really appreciate uh, what you have shared with everyone, your passion for this kind of work. And I think it's just fascinating to bring uh, people from different backgrounds uh, who try to tackle this issue in different ways together. So uh, I uh, really look forward to working with all of you in the future. Uh, I wanna thank the audience um, from Japan, the US and other places for joining us. Um, Jennifer, truly appreciate your moderating okay. this. Um, and uh, to everyone, Afshan, Naoko, Nori, Don, thank you so much. Uh, once again, I want to thank the Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnership and thank Elemental uh, as well for being a, a co-sponsor of uh, this particular webinar. Um, we, uh, this is the third of three climate-related webinars that we did, and we will use lessons learned from these as a base to continue uh, a series of webinars throughout 2021 on this topic. So please stay in touch uh, with us through uh, oistfoundation.org, oistfoundation.org uh, to learn about uh, the events coming up. With that, we'll close. Uh, thank you so very much again for joining us. Have a great evening or day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.